For everyone watching the recording, welcome to the Special Purpose Operating System Group uh, meeting. Well, everyone here too. Um, we are a CNCF working group under Tag Runtime, so we follow the CNCF Code of Conduct. That is linked in the agenda doc. And um, and if you have any other items to, that you'd like to talk about today, feel free to throw it in that agenda doc. Uh, otherwise, we have a Google Container Operating System Overview. Um, so. Now, hand it over to you, Justin. Perfect. Let me see if I can make this work. All right. Uh, so uh, real quick, I'll introduce myself and, and then, then we'll launch in. My name is Justin Haynes. I've been at Google for about a year and a half now. Um, and I'm a lead for the Container Optimized Operating System team. Um, I guess more there, I work under the guest OS uh, organization. So my larger org is responsible for all the guest VMs in GCP. So that includes Windows, all the other Linuxes, um, as well as as well as cost. Cost is the only uh, Google built Linux distro that's available in GCP. Um, so I'll, I'll call Google's container optimized OS costs throughout all of this. Uh, sometimes you see it written as, as G costs, um, but at least internally, and when we're talking amongst ourselves, it's just costs. Uh, so real quick, we'll talk a little bit about what in the world costs is trying to be. Um, spend a little bit on history because costs is old, uh, older than than uh, I guess even I realized, um, and and shares some kind of common history. It's worth talking about. We'll go a little more into the specifics of costs, um, and then talk about kind of its 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 future uh, as it relates to its past. So, costs is is another operating system that's built for running containers, and so the idea is your user space is as small as it can be, for, uh, for varying definitions of of small and can be. Right, um, but the goal is to run containers, and so the the, the user space outside of the container is is fairly minimal um, because it has the special narrow use case. You can do a lot of things around security that you usually can't do in a full fledged operating system. Things like making most of it read only. Uh, the writable portions are are tempfs's or or other other kind of nods towards non persistent threats. There's no package manager at cost. Kind of you get what you get. Um, and then uh, it's also built to, to scale, right? We were, cost was built originally to be the operating system that underpins things like GKE as well as managed services and GC. So the scale here that we're talking about is, is large. Um, and then last, but very much not least, cost is open source. Uh, it's not open development, um, but it is open source. You can see all of our sources uh, online and then see all the, all the activity. Well, that didn't render very well, did it? There, that's the one I wanted. Uh, so, cost is technically related to Gen two. Um, we use uh, we use some of the Portage packages. We use Emerge and eBuilds. Um, so that, that that's kind of the, the lineage, but we've diverged a long way. So long ago in twenty twenty two is when when Gen two showed up, but. Um, Chromium was was released in in two thousand nine, and that was the open source version of Chrome OS, which landed in, in two thousand eleven. Those are all Gen two based, um, and still are today. Um, and so we share a lot of of the technology behind those those two operating systems. We still lean on their SDK pretty heavily. Um, uh, our update mechanism in COS is a partition flip that that uses the same tools and, and techniques as, as Chrome's. Um, uh, we also like lean on their update mechanism tooling, like actual on system um, components for better or for worse. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, in 2013, 2013 was kind of a big year. That was the, the beginning of GCE. It was also the first launch of CoreOS, which is a fork of Chrome OS originally. Um, it has since uh, taken many, many twists and turns and is now kind of Either no longer or or flat car, depending on how you look at it. Um, <laughs> and uh, but but so Chrome OS had, had already started to to spin off uh, and create some of these other projects that were actually focused on containers. 
in 2016 is when in, when cost development finally started and, and 2017 is when it GA. So cost is getting pretty old now in the grand scheme of container focused OSs, right? Um, and it's and it's changed a lot both with kind of its its uh, uh, its kind of internal mission uh, as well as uh, all the various features and things like that that it supports. Cost releases every six months these days, and we have a two-year support cycle. So uh, we have four supported milestones at any given time, uh, and, and then one in development. Uh, the support there, uh, we, we use the phrase LTS. Uh, I don't know if all of you have these conversations, but the S in LTS is a controversial letter, um, right? It means support, uh, but a lot of people read it to also mean variations on stability and performance guarantees uh, and, and figuring out kind of exactly what that definition is, both with what customers think it is, as well as what you actually do is, is can be really challenging, especially when you're trying to support like components in the container stack that are based on Go for two years, like a bunch of those things don't really work together. Uh, and so you, you, you have to make some really interesting decisions uh, as far as kind of backports of security and things like that. The one thing we definitely do is remain on an LTS kernel. So the kernel uh, miner stays fixed throughout, the, throughout an LTS of costs. Uh, if at all possible, we keep run C, container D, and Docker fixed throughout that, that period too. Um, I stole these next couple slides, and I'm not going to read everything on them because it, I think, would be boring. But um, right, co cost grew a lot early on. Um, for whatever reason, uh, I have not actually learned the reason. Chromium and Chrome do milestone releases and skip four, um, and so we do the same thing. Uh, so, so just here in today-ish, <laughs> we're releasing uh, our 113 release which was preceded by 109 and 105 on back through time. And this slide just kind of shows some of the history. So originally, cost was very much a, like a, a build of Chrome OS, um, a, a variant or a, not even a fork. We used their build infrastructure. We used all of their tooling. We were kind of just another build definition um, at the outset. Over time, we, we realized that our needs and Chrome's needs differed enough that we needed to start moving further away from, from them. And so it was, you know, around four years ago that we spun up our own build infrastructure, our own test infrastructure that was separate from theirs. Um, and, and now today, cost is very much, you know, it, it's more like a shared lineage uh, than a fork or even, uh, or, or anything like that of, of Gentoo or Chrome, Chrome OS. We still use a lot of Gentoo upstream packages. Uh, we use the build system and, and the SDK from, from Chrome. Um, but that's a that's kind of where, where our overlap ends these days. We build our own kernel. We build all of our own um, the most important first party packages like the container stack. Um, and we run all of our own infrastructure. Uh, Anthos is a, is a GKE thing that was GKE on, on other clouds. Um, so we, of course, support that. And then um, GCE introduced ARM support, and, and cost supports that natively. Uh, so specifics, uh, what what in the world is is cost? It's a lot like a lot of these others, right? We are we are the guest OS in this group. Doesn't need to hear that, but but lots of other people do. Um, so the cloud spin up VMs. Cost is the operating system that runs in the VM. Uh, and then you bring your own containers through some sort of orchestration, usually. Uh, we have some internal customers that have kind of written their own orchestration. Our biggest internal customer is GKE. So, so their customers, uh, most of them run on costs for the worker nodes and the control plane nodes uh, also run on costs. Uh, so the idea, I mentioned this earlier, the user space is kind of as slim as it possibly can be. We have things like monitoring agents, uh, logging agents, the the core um, container stack, and we actually bundle our own kubelet. It's not the one that GKE uses, but it is there, and some of our internal customers use, use their own Kubernetes uh, clusters. Um, Google also has this thing called the guest agent. Um, it's uh, sort of like CloudNet, but much smaller and not as full-featured. 
Um, it does a handful of, of nice bits and bobs for you. Um, this doesn't, or it does show it. So we, we have both cloud and, and guest agent. So you're able to kind of bring your own user data and, and do whatever uh, if you're running costs bare. Uh, if you're running on GKE, uh, the customization options are more limited. So I said a handful of these things already, but, but we'll double down. Um, one of the reasons cost was built is because it's a Google built operating system. It means we can do things to make ourselves integrate with Google products much more easily than trying to work with, with the other distros. We do work with the other distros. That's the whole other chunk of my organization's job. Um, uh, but sometimes either there are, are challenges there or, or we're trying to build something that we know an, another distro won't necessarily want. Um, and costs can, cost can potentially uh, ingest those changes and make them available to customers. Um, it also means we can kind of be first on the ground for new products and new machine types. Uh, the machine type release cadence at, uh, at Google's cloud has skyrocketed here in the last year and a half and, and shows no signs of stopping. And so um, being able to make sure that we always have a, a, an operating system that we control, that we can land on, on GA is really important. We have wonderful uh, district partners that, that also join us on most of those uh, wherever possible. Um, it also lets us uh, lets us get security patches out on on our speed, uh, which which becomes really important. So I mentioned this before, but most uh, I don't think I can give specific numbers, but most of the managed services that are built on GCE and GCP that that you know and love today. Uh, most of them run costs under the covers. Uh, so things like I mentioned, the control plane of GKE, and there's a, a whole bunch of the other uh, large services like Cloud SQL that are actually running costs underneath. Uh, and so being able to get patches out on, on our cadence uh, to all of those services is really important for both keeping them secure and of course the downstream knock-on effect of keeping their customers secure. Um, Google has things like TPUs, which are, you know, are, are, are built in house. And so the, the cycle to get TPU support into the Linux kernel and kind of up and then back down into distros can be long. And so certainly for testing and, and early release access and things like that, having, having something like costs or something that is in house uh, has proven, has proven really important. And this last bullet point is actually carrying a lot of weight. Um, over the years, cost has wanted to be many different things because cost is, is fairly old. Um, there was a time where, where cost really was hoping to work towards building a community and being open source, open development, you know, all, all of the things that kind of a lot of this audience knows and loves. Um, that's a big investment and, and, and it requires a lot of work and a lot of diligence. And frankly, it's, I've found it very, very hard to pull off when that wasn't the plan from the beginning. Um, and so uh, about a year ago, while we absolutely still support any customers who are running costs kind of natively, and we have a bunch um, that, that kind of spin up their own Kubernetes clusters on Google's cloud, and we're going to continue to support them. We're not trying to build an open community around costs these days. It's open source, partly because of the GPL, but also because like there's no reason for it not to. Um, there's no IP there. There's nothing wild and secret. Um, but we're not trying to build and create the community that, that some other projects that we've heard about really, really are. Instead, we're focused on, on really trying to be the best operating system for managed services on GCP. Um, I want to double down on the thing I said a second ago. Like, we love the customers that we have that are running natively and we're happy to support them and we do work for them and we add features and things like that. But, but our big focus is, you know, how do we make, how do we make Cloud SQL? How do we make GKE run as well as they can? That's all I've got. I can talk way more about the specifics of costs if we want to. I think we've talked so much about a lot of these other operating systems that I was worried that I would just be rehashing. Uh, a, a lot of the same stuff. And so I thought I would stay at a high level at least to start with and see uh, where folks wanted to go. 
So thank you. That was great. Thank you. So I, I guess the kind of obvious question for the from the from the flat car side is um, so Chorus was around at roughly the same time and also followed roughly the same um, uh, like development path. Um, what would you say, since Flatka is a direct descendant of Chorus, uh, what would you say are the, are the similarities and differences to how Chorus approached this problem? Uh, that, that's, I guess, a less loaded question than what I thought you were going to ask, which is like, why didn't we just use? No, no, no it's, that is that is not what I'm asking. I think, for, uh, no, particularly, I... particularly in the last slide, you gave a very good rationale in in why this needs to be a Google specific and Google focused thing, and that makes a lot of sense for me. So that's not even my question. It's just, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess to the to the to answer that that question, the honest answer is I don't know. I wasn't there. Um, and I'm sure there was a lot of discussion around. I know it was considered. I just don't know the actual answer. Uh, I also don't know if I could share it if I did. Um, I also don't know that I know enough about kind of uh, the idiosyncrasies of flat car CoreOS versus um, versus cost. Uh, but let me give it a shot. Uh, so, so cost is let's say inflexible where where CoreOS is trying to be a little more flexible mm. in the user space, uh, right? Our user space is fixed. Um, we have no way of adding additional things with kind of a supported tool set, um, whereas, whereas CoreOS really has a supported tool set for adding stuff to the user space. Uh, that said, we have a tool called cost, uh, I know, ish. We have a tool called cost customizer um, and uh, most, if not all, of our internal customers use it. So they don't take the vanilla cost image that we build. They instead use Cost Customizer and make changes. Uh, cost Customizer lets you do a handful of things. It lets you uh, open up the read-only file system if you really want to. Um, we won't re-sign it, but you can do it. Um, it also uh, lets you put things in a location called the OEM partition which um, will, once you seal it, uh, it becomes marked as read-only and part of the DM Verity-backed uh, file system. And so if you install things there, they become at least part of DM Verity and read-only. Um, so we do have customization options, and people like GKE use them heavily to do their preloading because they want to own the very specific you know, bits that, that make up Kubernetes um, rather than us owning them and handing them off. Minor correction there, uh, CoreOS was never extendable. Like they did the same thing, uh, DM Verity secured um, uh, operating system partition. If you wanted to extend it, you would need to go the full way and, and build your own images. We, the, the extensibility with SysX, we just added recently to Fillet Car. Uh, and even, even Fedora CoreOS has a different uh, way of, of, of doing that. See, there you go. That's why I didn't want to answer. Yeah. Wrong. But Justin, I knew there were people that would make sure I was right. Justin, I've got two questions then. Awesome. Um, I think the immutability of the system is a powerful security value proposition. Um, you know, can you speak to the sort of like a detective controls, um, you know, uh, for discovering breakouts or how you would do alerting um, or discovery of um, uh, you know, any, any type of security problems is my first question. And then my second question is, um, somewhat is, you know, tangibly related for system services that have side effects, you know, like, uh, files, temporary files or things like that, you know, uh, how does the system, you know, differentiate between the two and this year I'm coming from somebody that has, uh, not instrumented top at all. Uh, so uh, relatively, but, but deeply familiar with the principles. Um, so the first, first question, um, I think this is just kind of, this, to, to some extent, this is a, a generic problem that I think many, if not most, or all operating systems face is, is kind of, can you build in kind of a first class detection mechanism for things that are not normal, um, right? Uh, and there's a, a huge number of products out there and services and companies that are spun up to do kind of NL-backed 
anomaly detection and they watch your workloads while they're good uh, and, and things like that. So, so that can be really hard. Um, short answer here is cost doesn't have any magic there. Um, we have things like DM Verity, right? So if you do manage to write something in a place that you're not supposed to, like the kernel will know and, and will kick you out, uh, reboot the system. Uh, the other nice thing about a lot of these OSs is, is, is the tempfs notion. And so a lot of the writable locations where you may store some of that um, temporary file state are going to be wiped out and recreated and repopulated on, on boot. Um, and so, you, you know, it's, it's hard, hard to persist, persist a threat, but there are also places within cost that are absolutely writable uh, in the traditional sense. It will not go away on reboots. And so um, figuring out more and more ways to uh, detect that uh, when, when it's not supposed to happen versus know that, uh, know that it was supposed to happen because, you know, uh, GKE runs uh, today in slash home slash Kubernetes. That's where the Kubla is, right? And so it's going to do all sorts of things in that, in that location. And so it's not fair to say nothing should happen there. Um, and it's really challenging to say only this set of things should happen there. Uh, the other half of your question was, before I get it wrong. Side effects. You, I mean, you kind of answered it. Uh, yeah. You know, temporary files, mm -hmm. things like that. I work on WebAssembly. Um, so, you know, we are, um, you know, just exploring various distributions right now. So I'm not a regular attendee of this call, uh, but I'm spending some time um, just spiking on this issue a little bit um, to see what we should be looking at. And we've got a pretty... You know, we essentially have a tiny virtual machine um, uh, for, you know, bifurcating side effects anyway, but we do have lots of things that create side effects now that we have networking and threads and sockets with WASI Preview 2. So we're really just trying to be a little more intentional in thinking about when we're building platforms uh, and systems. Yeah, I think the way we've thought about this in, at least the way I've thought about this in, in this space is, you know, what we're building is for is an operating system for like customers to bring who knows what uh, to the to the system, but but in a container, right? Um, or in, in this case, as a as a as a virtual machine, um, and it's really challenging for us as the builder of that underlying operating system to say much about what they should and shouldn't do in their container. Um, and in fact, for the most part, uh, we try not to. Uh, sometimes there are there are things that we say well, we probably shouldn't do that, or if you do do that, like you're kind of breaking the contract here with the operating system. Um, <clears throat> but what we can do as as operating system vendors and operating system builders is is work to further isolate those two things, things like GVisor, things like Firecracker and Firecracker Container D, things like Wasm, all really help to draw brighter and brighter lines. Right, we're still not talking full VMM. Um, we're still needing some amount of side effecty stuff on the host, um, but more and more of that side effecty stuff that's happening on the host can be kind of as a direct result of the orchestration tools rather than the customer workload systems that, that come down, right? And so you have you have kind of additional guarantees there. No, no, no. From within a container, you can't create new networks unless you've already said you can you can do that, right? Um, and so, like at the bare minimum, there's things like. Uh, set comp and, and things like that. And then as you work your way up, you add app armor, divisors, SE Linuxes, uh, potentially all the way up to some some sort of micro VM um, technology. Um, that's the way I've really thought about it, just because it's so challenging to understand what a customer might want to do in the place where you're suggesting that they should work. The other, interestingly, um, the other one that comes up a lot, and, and this is potentially just a product of the times, but certainly large companies um, can be very slow to move. A lot of large companies have policies around, you know, we must have fill in the blank security agent or auditing agent, and it cannot run, uh, it must run early in the boot process, and therefore it must run on the host system. And, and figuring out how to kind of enable some of the big enterprise customers to bring their official policies and, and adapt them to this containerized workload notion, whether we somehow figure out how to put them in a container and, and get, get over their security needs or 
how we give them the right tools and, and techniques to, to do this outside of kind of the orchestrated containers. It's also been really challenging and like similar problem, right? Uh, customer wants to kind of like break the whole notion of we, we did the OS underneath part for you, just bring your containers. And where do you draw the lines and guarantees there, especially when you're saying like, a package manager is too far, but what isn't? Thank you. I don't know if anybody else has, has thoughts about, about this space. I think it's a big space and one that like, certainly given the number of talks at, at KubeCon that were kind of surrounding the like notions of further container isolation, whatever we want to call that. Uh, I think it's one that's, that's good. Not really, not really further isolation, but, but less isolation because you mentioned one of the use cases of being able to run early boot stuff uh, is um, something that we've been investigating to extend flat car uh, beyond just running containers. And one of the, um, one of the use cases we've actually been looking at is uh, to just ship a WASM runtime uh, with Flatcar and uh, enable users to disable containers entirely, so that Docker isn't even in any of the paths. And uh, we've been we've been heavily betting on uh, system Sysdex for that. Um, there's a number of examples out there. If you if you go with for Flatcar Sysdex, you'll find them. I think it's um it's a reusable mechanism for for many specialized operating systems so justin i don't know if it would make any sense for uh google cost to take a look at that as well yeah we definitely have system v i think the one of the challenges that we run into is uh whether it's fedramp proper or or various organizations interpretations of fedramp right okay uh, often that means you know like just because Docker is there and not running and no one's touching it doesn't mean you don't have to patch it at FedRAMP cadences, right? Um, and that, that, that's, the fun, that's the fun thing with SysX. If you mask SysX, then Docker isn't there. Like it literally is not in the file system if you don't merge the respective SysX. Hmm, okay. We'll have to poke, more, poke at it more. I, your knowledge of, of system D SysX is, is vastly superior to mine. The other thing that that like I'd like to ask is uh, see we basically with um, with uh, Chorus Container Linux and uh, so they 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 are based on Chromium OS right um, and they were using some of the Chromium OS tools and I'm I'm entirely ignorant <laughs> regarding last ten years of development in Chromium OS and by implication uh, Google Cost but I'd be interested if you for for development and build, if you're still using, you said you're using the the, the Chrome OS SDK, so you're still using the the core change root thingy. Do you know about that? I I don't know about that. So the, I, what I do know is the big thing that we're using from the uh, Chrome OS SDK is the language runtime. So C and C++ oh, okay. Okay. is is like that's really what we lean heavily on them for. They move a little slower than we do with, with Go, and, and we also have some Rust code, and so we bring our own Go and Rust language runtimes to the SDK. But the big thing we lean on them for these days is, is, the, uh, is, is C and C++. Uh, that said, like, we also pull in a bunch of their code, which is mostly in Go, but not entirely, for the update mechanism. Um, so we use the same mm -hmm. update code that 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 Chrome does under the covers. It does the partition uh, partition download and partition flip. So the reason I bring this up is because so we we kind of uh, moved away from it is probably replaced in in Chrome OS these days as well. We we, we moved away from the old SDK uh, that we inherited with um, with uh, Core OS, and we basically nowadays. Just use um, a stage four Gentoo tarball um, that we containerize, and then we ship a container containerized operating uh, containerized SDK, and that was kind of it was a huge improvement of the whole developer experience and build experience. So the same uh, container SDK is being used in the in the CI builds and everything. Um, I don't know. So obviously it's not directly useful for costs, but uh, I'd be uh, interest to learn if you know the concept would would ease um, anything for for you folks because for us it was just it, it saved us maybe 50 60 percent of development time when you know patching and adding packages and stuff like that yeah we, we have some work afoot to 
<clears throat> do something wildly different than that, but for the same end goal, right? B because all of this is Gentoo based, um, you, you, you right? Gentoo rebuilds the world. That's yeah, like yeah, that's yeah. whole plan. Um, and and so uh, you might make a small change in the package, and the, and the build time is very very long, especially because yeah. we now support ARM, which uh, cross compiling takes a, a long time. Um, yeah. So we're we're working on ways to speed it up, but it's it's a totally different different path. If I can break in with a question about Gen two, yeah. so um, Koss and Flatcar both have long heritage from Gen two. What I'd love to understand is how much of the modern Gen two current releases are you each or all just generally dependent on how how tightly coupled are you to the underlying open source project and how much has been peeled away as a result of replacing or rethinking componentry yeah so uh cost you can think of cost as having <clears throat> kind of three upstreams if you if you will um the internet uh so right like docker the container stack the kernel we take those from the canonical upstream source um, we, we mirror them internally, kind of selected mirrors as we need updates, and then we carry our own patches on top of them and have our own e-builds um, and everything like that for, for some chunk. Another upstream is, is Chrome OS. So we get, like, like I said, the, the first party code from them that is the update mechanism and a handful of other things. And then we have a third upstream, which is Portage Stable. Um, again, we don't mirror all of Portage Stable. We have a very selective mirror. We can carry patches on it. Uh, we can update those things out of band of a Portage stable update if we want to, and then let Portage catch up. And so while we, and I don't know the exact breakdown, um, the number of things that COS is owning kind of in that first category is increasing uh, as COS kind of grows, and the number of things in the other two categories is decreasing. But the, the you know, the things we depend on in Portage stable uh, there's still there's still things out there that, that we do. Cost has has a lot of user space that like, I didn't mention in that slide, um, and and some of that user space that is much more slow moving and is not kind of directly related to, to the container workloads, but maybe is a debugging tool set or something like that. Uh, we we look to, to places like like Gentoo for for those things. Um, if for whatever reason we like learned that. Uh, they were going a direction that that didn't work for costs or um, something like that. We would just bring it bring it kind of in house. Um, we also push changes back upstream when when we can and when necessary, um, if, if it makes sense. It doesn't always make sense to do that. Um, but does that answer your question at all? I, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. And and the uh, making the distinction between Portage and the rest of the entire distribution probably clarifies things in my mind. It's a it's a package manager that you're pulling selectively packages from in ways that are typical for packages to be shared. So, well, and, and right, we're, we're right, Gentoo in particular, but but were this any other uh, operating system base, like if if cost was Debian based. Apparently at one point long ago it was for a little while. Um, we wouldn't be pulling the packages directly from Debian and we aren't pulling packages because you can't from, from Gen 2, right? We're pulling packaging definitions and source code tarballs and and doing our own unit builds. And we would do the same if it was if it was Debian based or something like that, something else. Kind of same with Redcar, but we're moving into the the opposite direction in that we're actually trying to align most of our packages with Gentoo. Uh, we're doing our own qualifications as um, as uh, Google Cos um, probably does as well. So we have a we have our own stabilization paths. Uh, so we don't need to follow Gentoo releases in lockstep. We just Using the package descriptions um, up to the point where we are using uh, package releases or meta package releases, ebuild releases that upstream are marked unstable because they are too new, and then we're kind of stabilizing them through the uh, through the release processes and the alpha beta stable um, 
process and then actually uh, contribute back to upstream in, in you know declaring those packages stable. Uh, and that's pretty welcome. We have a number of um, of uh, patches and features in core gen two stuff uh, in e classes that are basically used by many e builds. Um, just because we're moving a lot closer to Gen two uh, pack package and e build wise, I think the best example is um, we enabled slash fixed cross compiling for Go packages. Uh, it turns out uh, Go cross compiling wasn't even possible with Gen two uh, up until I think half a year ago. So we added that feature because we've been using it in Flatcar for ages. Um, we just didn't contribute back, and then we found out that it. Things don't work upstream, so that's one of the things that we did, um, and we're, we're basically aiming for for um, a lot of upstreaming. We actually have a, a very active Gen2 maintainer, Chewy, um, who does a lot of the Java maintenance there, a lot of the cross compiler maintenance there. Uh, we ha we have him join the project, uh, the 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 team, at uh, at Microsoft soon in uh, I think two weeks. Um, so we're 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 trying to be a little closer there, and hopefully also. Uh, help help out uh, Google costs because that's kind of our our perspective. We we love to fix and share. Any other questions? Nice presentation, Justin. Um, I, I was reading a little bit um, about the OS uh, b before. Uh, you talk to us, and one feature that is so interesting is that you guys uh, provide uh, automatic updates, if I understand correctly, and uh, that, but they only trigger after a reboot or something like that. Can you explain how, how that works and, and how many updates uh, can be in the background or what mechanism you have there? Yeah, I, I kind of touched on it briefly, but I, I also kind of skipped past it because it's not really widely used. Um, and we actually have customers who have rolled their own update mechanism because of, of reasons. Um, so the, the updates are just uh, more files to the balls, right, uh, that, that live in a bucket. And we do releases weekly. So you can potentially get an update every week. And uh, so you maintain two partition sets. Uh, for many years, CoreOS did this. Bottle Rocket does it also. Um, there's a patch to GPT that lets you set partition set priority. And um, the update tooling is a bunch of fancy things to make sure you do that properly. Um, you download the other file system onto the other set of partitions. You twiddle that partition set priority in GPT, and then you reboot. And now you come up onto the old ones. Uh, you can have some fanciness that does some amount of checking to make sure the system is up and healthy. And if not, it can fall back to the old partition set that like, was known good. Um, come, uh, uh, products like Bottle Rocket have a, a fairly fancy uh, operator that runs with Kubernetes to handle these updates that can actually monitor the, the workloads in the clusters and their state so that you, you don't necessarily disrupt too much of the cluster. Costs, cost does not because instead it relies on GKE and GKE's infrastructure to do updates. And GKE's mechanism for doing updates is, input, is, is, is node replacement, but they have lots of safeguards that do a lot of the same things that the bottle rocket operator does, um, but with node replacement. The one, there, there's, there's two really common use cases that I've heard uh, uh, at multiple clouds um, for doing in-place updates. Um, or I guess there's three. The third is <clears throat> we have some very old understanding of, of the way we should operate in the cloud. And so we want in-place updates. The next one that is sort of related is, is generally around GPUs. Um, as hard as all the clouds are trying to build massive amounts of GPU capacity, they're all still a little bit capacity constrained. And so there are, <clears throat> There are customers who say, once I get my instance, I never want to let go of that. I don't want to try and replace it because I might not get one. Um, that's an unfortunate situation that I think everyone is working to resolve, but like not a great reason to build an in-place update mechanism. But that is one reason why people use it, um, is I need my freshness, but I don't want to let go of this reservation that I have on an instance that's kind of hard to get one. And then the, the third... I'll use S3 as the example because they're the one that I've thought about the most. They don't actually use 
costs or bottle rocket or any of these things. I don't know what they use. But I do know that S3 is wildly replicated, right? Any node that they may be running that has your stuff on it can clearly blink out of existence. But they try to be pretty fast, and so all of that data is stored locally to that node. And so if you replace that node, it's an expensive operation because you have to re-replicate everything, right? Versus having a, a, a network attached volume that you can stick on your node. Um, that's a little slower, it's much more expensive, something operating against three scale needs. It's real physical storage because it's just so much cheaper. And so ideally they would be, they're kind of a prime candidate. We have lots of local storage. It is, you know, it's it's replicated, it can die, but we don't want to have to recopy it all. And so we want to be able to replicate it. Uh, I'll, I sort of answered your question at the beginning and then, and then more on the Do you have anything else that you wanted to know about, about all that? Uh, cool, cool. Thanks. Uh, no, no, mainly just interested. Uh, we we haven't uh, gone into an automatic mechanism, so uh, it was interesting to know wh why and how it was used. Uh, I think that sometimes we have a bit too much of the opposite. Uh, people wanting to stay in a certain version because they already, I don't know, felt comfortable and are afraid of upgrades and and and, and all of that. So. Uh, hearing that uh, in your case is automatic, I thought, oh, wow. <laughs> I wouldn't even know how to tell some of the customers to try this out. Well, we have we have plenty of of, of that also. Um, and and I, kind of everywhere I've ever worked in operating system land, whether it's whether it's building them or as a customer, right? The, the upgrade is scary and it's hard and it's it never is perfect and seamless, <laughs> right? There, there's all like, especially if you're incredibly performance sensitive or you're kind of doing things that are a little more weird, you run into, you run into the edge cases. Um, and so we absolutely have, have customers that, uh, that want to stay put. One of the, uh, one of the ways we try to help there is um, cost does, uh, we backport changes to the kernel for three months and then we, and then we do a kernel merge up to the tip of an LTS release. And so like uh, COS uh, 107 uh, is on the 6.1 kernel and we backport CVE and bug fixes for three months. And then we move the 6.1 kernel to the tip of the 6.1 tree with any other patches that we need to continue to carry. And, and so you get three months of, of kind of kernel stability and performance, roughly performance stability, other than CVE fixes that, that mess with performance. Um, we do similar things with the container stack where, you know, we try to keep it as stationary as possible for as long as possible, but though those inevitably wind up having to move. We do try very, very hard um, and have been successful since I've been here um, at, at remaining on a fixed version of run C and container D major minor. Um, and we either backport or forward port, depending um, on, on what's required, security fixes and bug fixes to, to those versions. Every once in a while, you run into just some horrible incompatibility and you just have to move minor versions. Um, but that's becoming more rare. Uh, for a long time in the earlier days of the container stack, like that was just par uh, because it was moving so, so quickly. And so I think, I think you, can, you can find depending on your customers, you can find happy middle grounds um, that, that make it so your world isn't horrible and their world is a little more stable, but it, it's really hard. It's really hard. Sorry, you were about to say something. Oh, oh good. Thanks. I guess the, the other kind of mitigating factor, I think uh, that Bottle Rocket is a, is a the the example that comes into my head because we thought really hard about this and worked really hard at it, uh, Talos, I think, fits into this mold pretty well too, where the more you can limit the API surface, uh, whether that's through an actual API or through um, diligent documentation, maybe, um, as far as what customers expect to be fixed versus what can change at a moment's notice. I think that also really, really helps you, right? If, if you can somehow force uh, a customer to say the kernel major minor and Kubernetes major minor 
are the only things that you can rely on not changing. And everything else can change, but we can switch from container to pod man, and you shouldn't care. And if you do care, like you're using RLS wrong, this is very, very challenging to do. But if you could do that, right, that's not nearly as hard as saying like, well, every package we have in user space and the kernel may have some dependency that someone's taken on it. Like that, it's, that, that makes the whole notion of trying to keep your customers both secure and stable really, really hard. Um, so figuring out, figuring out how to establish the right contract is, is, is really, really important. And, and once you haven't uh, established that contract, right? So cost has been it, um, for better or worse. On first blush, one might think we can just update that to whatever we want. We can probably just delete it. But we have no idea if there's some very large customer who has some production dependency on the host VIM, right? And we can't. We can't know. A more interesting example is potentially Docker. GKE doesn't use Docker anymore. GKE uses ContainerD. However, we know that a lot of GKE customers use GKE as a CI system and use Docker mounted into their containers to do builds. And so we know we can't just remove Docker because a lot of their customers would break uh, for GKE. For other internal customers, though, like right, we actually can go sit down and talk to them and say, "Hey, are you using Docker? Oh, you're not. Well, we can give you a build without it." And that starts to streamline um, at least some corners of our world. Makes sense. These have been great questions. Thank you all for uh, filling filling in uh, the, the gap that was my very short presentation. All right. Thanks a lot, Justin. That was great. Oh, my, my pleasure. Sorry it took so long. <laughs> yeah, no, not at all. It was also pretty unfair to ask you to get up at like, what, six in the morning to talk about this? <laughs> I think it was like, Four when I, was, <laughs> when I was traveling, that was that was a bit much. But, Ouch! Uh, but time change has helped uh, to get us to seven instances. Yeah. Got to be pretty passionate if you want to get up at four a.m. to talk about container OSs. <laughs> that or have a day off where you can go back. To <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, I don't think anyone added anything else to the agenda. Um, open call. Anyone have any other topics they wanted to bring up? Uh, since Eric joined and we, we met Eric at the panel, um, the, the KubeCon panel last week, um, I wanted to ask whether it's worth it for Eve to, you know, have a have a foot in the door of, of the whole working group and maybe attend more regularly. And even, uh, so you just witnessed um, the, the the final installment of our series of um, specialized operating system presentations, uh, maybe okay. even present Eve uh, at some point in the future. Sure, I can do that. Um, I, 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 I want to go back and listen to the recording. So I assume the recording for all of the other calls to, to sort of what, what people have covered in the various presentations. So making it a little bit easier to compare because I don't have that that context while well, I looked at some of them in the past. But, um, but I don't, the next meeting is in in two weeks or something or what's, yeah. Yep, it's the first and third Thursday of every month. So I have to look at, let me see. Okay, I will be back in California then, that I know, so. <laughs> I think that should be workable, so. Um, and, and if the next one check. doesn't work out, we can get yeah. you on the agenda at, at any of the future ones. Okay. So something that came to mind, particularly with uh, the, the odd hours that have been raised a number of times. So I've seen other CNCF projects kind of shuffle this and have a meeting that works well for the Asia and EU time zone and another um at uh, for us uh, in in the EU at a later point in, uh, on on the day, maybe we could consider that uh, since we have two meetings a month, having a uh, uh, like one meeting like this, uh, two p.m. UTC, and then maybe another one uh, later in the in the evening. 
but just food for thought. So the the range of participants is between Central European time and Pacific time, or are there, are there other people in Asia as well that are typically on the call? So right now the the whole working group and meeting is pretty Europe centric uh, in that um, I mean East Coast is still manageable in terms of time e even though it's pretty early, but uh, I think West Coast is uh, is very challenging at this point in time. So yeah, it's seven a.m. right? So yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, I've been in groups that have done that. Partly because yeah, some participation from China and whatever, right? So you combine all of those, then yeah, you can't really find a convenient time. But um, but 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 then you get sort of two separate conversations as well. So that's a bit harder. But yeah, that, that was actually why I, I put my hand up. I think uh, there there are uh, I mean nine of us here right now. Um, you know, if, if we split the meeting into two two groups, I think we wouldn't necessarily cut the total attendance in half, but it would be less. Uh, mm -hmm. right? For the 6 a.m., I, I wouldn't necessarily be at, but when there's only the one, uh, I think it's pretty hard. But so so I think we should be cautious about that just so that uh, we, we can all. It's nice to talk to everybody, right? And, and have questions from everybody and have the interaction from everyone. Um, if we were a larger group, I think. The multiple the multiple times makes more sense, but maybe the multiple times makes sense so long as like this group is like right. Uh, uh, I can attend the six a.m. meetings, and and the Central Europe folks can attend the the eight, 8 p.m. meetings or something. And and if that's just what everybody's game to do, I I'd love to have some of these meetings. Uh, mm -hmm. kind of later. And you know the the meeting time topic has come up a few times, and I I I don't know, but I get a feeling we could get a few more West Coast U.S. people involved if it wasn't so early. But it's hard. Um, yeah, it'd be great to to make a decision, but I I think if folks want to think about what they would work well for them, um, yeah, definitely pros and cons. I mean, I like when we decided about this originally, we kind of opened it up for a vote, right? We had a couple of uh, open slots and then we voted. How about we try to get again this like possible slots <laughs> and um, open it up for a vote? I mean, I'm totally open for that, but uh, the problem is we don't have anyone from Asia here, so they will not... <laughs> Talk uh, yeah, how they yeah. would rather have this earlier. <laughs> the voting yeah. results are kind of selective by who's already can convenienced, I guess, by the the current time. <laughs> but yeah, we could we could put a call out there in the Slack channel and try to see if there's anybody else yeah. that's been looking around. We we could make it more approachable in putting only one of the two uh, monthly meetings to vote. Say the one at at the end of the month and say. Should we move that to um I don't know, uh eight a.m. or ten a.m. uh PDT and then go from there, or or stick with UTC, which I really really like um because of the uh daylight saving times, which confusion twice a year. Okay. Yeah. 